Hi, I guess it's time to get started. My name is Mike Cambria. I currently work for Red Hat. Been there about six or eight months, formerly from some of the usual suspects, running, switching vendors in the Boston area. Uh, today, we're going to talk about essentially container networking, and we're going to dabble into little Kubernetes just to tie it all together with one of the more prevalent container runtimes. This is a tutorial. It's going to essentially teach you not networking. If you're in this room, you probably know everything I'm about to talk about. But the goal is to try to tie a lot of things together that you already know you might not have known you knew. There's nothing special about networking when containers are involved. And I guess we can just dive into it. My, some of my coworkers who are not here, Doug Smith and Dan Williams, also contributed to the, this presentation. Next slide, please. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. I can certainly. OK, so uh, some ground rules. Uh, I'm assuming you know what a container is, just at least in the basic level. You've heard about things like Kubernetes, Docker, Podman, or just Net. Thank you. Or even just using LXC in Linux or uh, IP, the IP route 2 command for net namespace, add, exec, etc. There's nothing special there. Uh, this is not a Kubernetes talk. We're just going to talk about how Kubernetes does tie into networking and then maybe a little pros and cons about what they do. It's also not a Docker talk. Docker does not use CNI for the container networking interface. So we will talk a little bit about it. I'll use it for some context in case people are familiar. How many people know what Docker is? OK. LXC and IP route, I'm assuming, is a given. OK. Uh, again, the focus here is on Linux container networking, you, the CNI interface, and how the runtimes use it, and it, the, it, what it does and doesn't do regarding the Linux stack is sort of like the part that's going to connect what you already know to this mysterious uh, container networking. Um, and one other thing is CNI can be used by a lot of things, not just Kubernetes. Docker doesn't use it, but pretty much all the other runtimes for containers do. So what we will talk about is I'm going to spend a lot of time on what CNI is. It's the glue that holds all this container networking together, at least within this scope. Uh, I'm going to talk about how the runtimes use it. I'm going to give you some basic use of CNI to give you some ground rule, groundwork on how it's actually being used by runtimes. And then we're going to get into what Kubernetes does and doesn't do regarding uh, namespaces. And we're going to then talk about a specific plugin, Multis, created by Intel originally, that will solve some of the problems uh, or problems, quote unquote, depending on your point of view, of what m Kubernetes doesn't bring to the table. Any questions? Interrupts are enabled, so please just raise your hand, shout, let me know. Uh, so anyway, this is a brief history. You can read it yourself of what CNI is. Essentially, it's not Docker networking. When Docker hit the scene, a lot of people were using it and the networking was somewhat limited. You needed to get things pushed into their repository in order to add something like Mac VLAN or anything else that you might have already had with Linux. So a whole bunch of people got involved to create CNI to let you do in a more open fashion, have more and more access to what Linux already did. At the end of the day, as you'll see throughout the talk, Linux is doing all the heavy lifting. There's nothing special here. We're just telling you how you can get a container to actually get a net dev device in Linux and set other parameters, et cetera. And this is literally from the GitHub repo for CNI. And it's, that's the formal mission statement, if you will. Anyone can contribute. Pull requests always welcome. And again, so this is what the CNI plugins are formally. It's, a, it's responsible for adding network interfaces into a container. That's the TLDR. There's the link for the repo. Um, 
And so now there are several basic types of plugins. The ones you're going to care about mostly, you're almost always going to have a main interface. It is what's going to create either a Linux bridge, a port on a Linux bridge, Mac VLAN, IP VLAN. We're going to cover a lot of these in a minute. The other major type is IPAM. For the most part, you always need an IPAM unless you bundle something like a DHCP client in your container. The problem with that, of course, is the container model, for those who aren't familiar, is you're supposed to have one thing running with PID1, something like Apache, Nginx, H, it doesn't make a difference, but you're supposed to have one process. If you do a PS on, PSAX, et cetera, on inside a container, you're supposed to see very, very few things, ideally one, and that's the executable you're actually running. People understand that? So if you were to go off and bundle like ISC DHCP client into your container, you're already starting to break that model. But if you did something like that, then you wouldn't need an IPAM at all. Otherwise, the CNI needs to bring IPAM to you. And they, I'll talk about the types we have. And then there's another uh, type of plugin called Meta that I'm going to put. It's probably easier to wait until we get there. But it lets you do various things like tune parameters, IP tables, rules, etc. Uh, one disclaimer, CNI plugins also talk about things like they contain a Windows. I don't know what that is. I've never touched it. I just know that there's something in there relating to Windows, and that's all I'm going to say about it today. But there's also one other plugin, which is called the Sample, which is kind of like the, a template, if you will, for you to build your own plugins of any type, main, IPM, or meta. Okay, so the main itself. You, these should look familiar to anyone familiar with IP Route 2. Bridge, Linux Bridge, it's, it's typical Docker Zero if you've played with Docker. This is the kind of thing that's created. There's also IP VLAN, Loopback, Mac VLAN, point to point, a VLAN, a host device, which is actually you can literally put like a real NIC inside your container with that plugin. Again, nothing special. All they're going to do is you're going to have a container getting a NetDev device that you're already well familiar with. Questions? So now to the interesting IPAM, because like you said before, you're going to need to somehow get an address in. You can either have a static one, you can use DHCP that's built into the container, but like I said, you're not, if you grab a container on Docker Hub or something else, you're probably not going to have a DHCP client built into the image. So what you can do there is the CNI DHCP IPAM plugin will talk to a DHCP server on your behalf and deal with the addresses, DHCP, anything else that comes from a real DHCP server that your enterprise may already run, and it will make sure that that information gets on your ETH0 or whatever net dev, net dev device that you have. And host local is another way of just doing static where every node where CNI runs and containers will run will get an address based out of the, the SID of address or whatever else is configured for that host local plugin. Now, there'll be examples in a minute. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. The container model is, it, the goal is, with containers, you're supposed to be very, very, very lightweight. And you don't want to do anything in your container image other than like Apache. You could, if you wanted to, bundle a DHCP client inside your container image. But most people don't do that. The goal is to be very, very lightweight. It, now, not everybody obeys that rule. I've seen some containers that have, uh, they think they're VMs. But again, that's up to what you want to do in your container. Yeah, you pretty much want to run, and I might have examples on this in a minute, Apache. And that's all it's going to do. PID1 is Apache. And it will be just running one, not a series of them. Because in the container world, if you wanted multiple um, processes listening to incoming connections, you'd spin up 
multiple containers, and then you let the container infrastructure deal with load balancing and all that stuff. So the, it's, it's a different world, but what I'm hoping to get through today is to explain that, that you're going to find that you already know all this stuff. You just have to see how they're packaging it. When I kept looking at it initially about three or four years ago, Started with Docker like most people and just kept trying, well, what am I missing? What am I? And then you find out that a lot of times that I'm getting ahead of myself in a bit, but since we have context, a lot of times you're looking for stuff that isn't there because they haven't done it yet and they're going to find out the hard way that this is what, you know, this, we've got been un doing Unix for what, 30, 40 years, something like that. So there's a lot of experience that people in this room already have that some of this, you know, containers is kind of new and they're learning as they go, if you will. Or you're not learning, but you can only get so many diffs committed. You, could, you know, there's work that has to be done. And usually people solve one problem and then you move on to the next one. Uh, the meta plugins. So these are things that don't fit into getting an interface into your container, but are kind of useful for actually doing real work. Uh, one of them, the plugins that come with the CNI repository, Flannel, which is a, lo a simplistic, if you will, VXLAN plugin. It'll start putting, uh, setting up tunnels between all the containers so they can talk to each other on the same broadcast domain. Tuning is starting to get into some of the interesting stuff where you can start setting syscuttle values. When syscuttles are not global to the Linux node and they've got syscuttles per namespace, this is how you can start tuning them so that when you start, you may only want to support, a, I don't know, you, the MTU size can change, the Ethernet address can change. You might want to set a limit on socket connections. And what you can and can't do is not limited by CNI, it's limited to what namespace support has for things like syscuttle in the kernel. Port map is an important one because unfortunately the world wants the net. And this is the way that you can get, when a device is added to a container, the host can get to it via port mapping, and you don't know what the address is yet. Once it's assigned, the host will know, the CNI will know, and it will start adding rules to IP tables so that you can start hitting port 8080 on the host. We'll, put, we'll get netted into, port forwarded into the container on whatever port that you want. You know, what things you would have done with IP tables and masquerading uh, anyway, you, but this is all going to be automated. And one of the reasons for a lot of this stuff is the arguments to these Plugins tend to be wildcat, not wildcat, variables, because they have tools, whether it's Ansible or equivalent or Kubernetes, may, they all pass in environment variables and uh, other things that so that you can just do it, come up with a template. And the, the, at one time, when the, cre cre when the container is created, it will start filling in the blanks, and you can just do things once, and then just start supplying arguments when the containers are created. Uh, bandwidth plugins allows you to use TC rules to start limit, limiting what can go in and out of a container if you so choose. All these are optional. And there's another one that I've only started looking at, source-based routing, that I don't even know what it does yet. I list it there for completeness. I just haven't had a chance. It's, it's fairly new to the master repository. I don't think any of the release, CNI releases have it yet. Questions? Am I going too fast? Can you understand the Boston accent? <laughs> That's a problem if you can't. Okay, so these are just some of the players who are actually using it. And again, this is all coming from the, the CNI's GitHub page. And I'm sure there's dozens more that aren't there yet, aren't listed. But just to give you an idea of some of the players, Rocket came with CoreOS when that startup now owned by Red Hat. They still use it. Kubernetes uses it. OpenShift, Cloud Foundry, Mesos I spent a lot of time with. Uh, Podman's another one that I've been spending a lot of time with recently, and I'm going to give you some examples of that because it really, it really exercises CNI. Well, um, it, the full feature set of CNI fairly sim in a simple way. Okay, here's some more people, and this is no, these are third parties that are not part of the 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 CNI GitHub repo, but you have to go to their sites to do it, and this is just literally scratching the surface of people who have done it. Places that I've been in the past do have their own plugins that aren't even public, and 
you know, the others that have just been able to take the spec, take the samples, and customize them to what their business need was. Okay, so quick level set on what is going on with containers versus VMs. We touched on it a little bit earlier. It, one of the things I, I keep stressing and I will continue to stress in this pitch is there's nothing new here. The same RFCs, the same specs, the same Linux. There's, it, it's what you do with container networking, regardless of if it's CNI or not, or CNI is, is the same stuff that you're already familiar with. The goal of this tutorial is to simply tie some things together and point out that you already know this, you just might not know you know it. And it'll expose it to you for the first time, and that's usually what it will take. Uh, there are some differences, though, in how the containers are used versus the VM. Containers are meant to be real, well, you can let them live for as long as you want, but they tend to come and go fairly quickly. The analogy is with Linux, if you do you follow the Unix model where you do one thing, you do one thing well. Like you do ls, pipe it to grep, pipe that to something else. Every one of those bash commands that you're piping from one to another, think of as a container. And think of the network as the pipe that gets from one container to another. So the goal is the packet comes in, you hit Nginx, it figures out where it goes next, it sends it to another container and then eventually it might do something else like hit a database. And as needed, outside the scope of this talk, but it's important to why people are using this, the network with containers is, there are tools that'll turn around and say, okay, I, I'm starting to hit capacity with, I've, with my web server, so let me go off and start up a few more containers, over in the Kubernetes world will be called, called pods, and then it'll start handling the load, and things are supposed to automatically start telling the load balances about these new, pla these new containers, and the network's supposed to just find them. And some of the things that CNI does aids in that effort. Does that make sense? So whereas we were talking before, a VM is a complete host, and does everything that a PC or a server would have normally done, whether it's DHCP, had a static address. These things tend to be very, very small, lightweight processes. Literally, if you follow the container model, it's supposed to be one process. If you're to be a pure container, and I don't know, they might have terminology for it, I just, I just tend to run one. You run whatever you would normally run in a command. Usually in the old days, you would run daemons, and you would demonize, and you'd be taking input from things like standard in, standard out. What, with a container, you won't run anything demonized. You run it from, the, quote unquote, the command line, or with exec it, and everything would come in from the usual, whether it's the network or standard in, standard out, et cetera. That makes sense? Good. Right, or that's exactly what CNI does, and the f and, those and so if you go to the VM example, you can you can provide a NIC to a, to a VM in three different ways: emulation, power virtual, or SRI or V. And then you have the provisioning of the virtual switch on the hypervisor, which fits each of those methods. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, I, what is the equivalent in provisioning uh, networking for containers? Th that's the subject of this talk. CNI will I do mean that. The networking part, which is not inside the container, the networking part in the hypervisor. There is no hy well. Do you the, give the us whatever you call it. The host. In the host. Right, well, <laughs> or it could be bare metal. Right, yes, but it, it can it, be a VM it, even. No, mm -hmm. it can be nested. In and what VM. happens is CNI, the software that's involved to make this happen, has a. It runs on the host and it knows how to get into the net namespace of the container, and it will put a VE, one end of the, to use a bridge yeah, as an example. VES is one example, mm -hmm. and th this is the NIC of the container. Now this container wants to talk outside, so maybe they are part of a tenant, it has to go through mm -hmm. certain encapsulation, but or it, it has to go through some NAT and so on and so forth. Right, the NAT I described with port map, and I, I think I cover it again later, but how you quote unquote orchestrate all this is outside, I won't say it's outside the scope of this, but it's up to what your business need is. Like if you run 
these containers on one of the major cloud providers, they take care of getting you in and out of that cloud for you. If you run on bare metal, then you need to do something like add a second NIC to your container to deal with not sell traffic, for example. Yeah, Makes yeah, sense? I, I understand that, but the question is if there are tools or packages that actually deal with that, or everyone builds their own... Uh... Kubernetes is one that will do it. To see, it depends on where you, you're coming from. Kubernetes tries to do all that for you. And then there's another school of thought, like network geeks like me, I want to use my existing tools, that Ansible or whatever, Chef Puppet or Homegrown, and I want all the network provision using those tools because I've got networking staff that would, you know, already know how to do this, and the difference between a host running VM, VMs or containers, to them, they don't care. It, go back to what I said originally, there's nothing new here. They don't know that it's a container or not, and... Typically, for container, you must run some sort of network address translation, whereas for VM, you don't have to do that. No, you don't have to here. Either you can, because that was the model that was started early on with Docker, or even, um, yeah, Docker is probably the best example because most people understand it. Everything with Docker used localhost, and they would net port forward in even though the namespace had the capability of having its own IP address. Then the next iteration is they realized, oh, well, I can give it an IP address using tools like this, and now the containers can talk to and from the bridge or to a, getting ahead of myself, an SIOV plugin, Mac VLAN, all these will go right to the top of, top of rack switch. Okay, so you, so you say the same concept, but still in your previous example, when you say that you pipe a command from my mm -hmm. container to container, so there is no virtual switch in this fight. Uh, actually, yeah, it's it's the it's the the containers all can talk to each other. That's sort of like I guess I should have made wasn't making that perfectly clear. The network's useless. All these containers are useless if they don't talk to each other. And CNI is that glue. Okay. And when I mentioned the pipe example, and I did say that the network is what makes them talk to each other. And you have to make sure they can. They got to be on the same layer two or routed network. And if they're multi-tenant, you don't want them talking to each other. That's how you use the tool, as opposed to the tool let you do anything you want. You can become very insecure, or you can be as secure as you want. Everything can be encrypted. SSL doesn't make a difference. When I say SSL, not TLS 1.2 or better, and or not, that's up to how you want to use the tool. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? How am I doing for time? Okay, so, uh, let's see. All right, so some of the, one of the things I want to mention again is with the containers versus the VM, containers tend to be short-lived, and we're starting to see some things that we kind of want networking to address in a better way. And, for example, IPs of these containers do come and go real fast. And one of the first things that we realized with a slash 24 on a local machine is we were wrapping these addresses fairly quickly, and up doesn't wrap as quickly. So there were some issues that we had to deal with. So you need to be aware of these things when you're starting to deploy. And the same with when, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, but just since I have context, NAT is a problem where you might port forward into your container via the local host, and then reverse traffic will be asymmetric because it has a source IP address, and it will send it right through the switch to the remote end, and some people don't like that, or they may have some tools that they didn't expect the traffic to go in different directions, and it, or you start adding multiple container network interfaces to the container. They may go out a different egress, out a different port. Uh, okay, and so there's some other stuff. Uh, Containers tend to run on VMs. These things are not mutually exclusive. You go to a, cl a cloud provider, you are getting a VM for the most part, and they'll run any of these containers, and the networking infrastructure will need to be able to cooperate. Uh, let's see. Yep. Oh, one other thing that I was I only figured out myself recently is you can actually run, depending on the tools you use, you can run containers and VMs as part of the same orchestration suite. So that if, you, if what makes more sense for you is a VM or you don't want to turn around, 
forklift it and try and make it into a container and everything runs in with you know one I, PID one your app doesn't fit that model run you can run it as a VM and still run it the rest or whatever you evolve to containers if that's what you want to go when I say containers you might also have heard of microservices architecture as far as I'm concerned it's the same thing there could be purists out there that can quibble with it but for the sake of this talk they're interchangeable Okay, so now we're going to get into a little bit of how CNI works, and you're going to—it's really, really simple. This is what you need to do to actually have your host get an IP address inside a container. These environment variables get set. You need to tell CNI where you can get to the configuration what the command is, add, delete, the path to the actual binaries, and then the namespace of the container, the container ID, and the interface name, if you want. Each zero is the default. Is there a question? Oh, sorry. Nothing. It's orthogonal. It's, so it's orthogonal. If DP, if I know that's a word that's not allowed to say here. But uh, there are customers that's running inside containers. Um, DPDK. My condolences. Yeah. Uh, DPDK inside the container. And the CNI is kind of trying to, to deal with it, but there is no security, no nothing, because there is no network namespace for uh, DPDK by default. We accept patches. Where, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, no, so, so when. In if you have a business need. No, so in Mellanox cases, we do have, because our DPDK is based on our NIC, so if you attach, uh, you give the namespace, uh, a netdev of the, for example, a virtual function to a netdev, then we enforce that all the traffic that is on this DPDK that's using this virtual function, is we are enforcing all the traffic. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of doing some kind of things, but we didn't see any movement in the community that's uh, Kubernetes with DPDK that's trying, you know, uh, to force this model. No, we're not forcing anything. We're, the interface lets you do whatever you need to do. And if, you know, if, if I don't know who governs, and I mean, we've got maintainers and stuff, and, and what becomes part of the official repo or not, I'm still trying to figure out. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to make sure all the basic plumbing with CNI works. And what you do or don't do is up to you. Okay. Kind of answering. Yeah, just want to know if there's a specific thing that you're aware of for DPDK. No, nothing at all. Sorry. Okay. So essentially, this is the API, if you will. You set those invariable, you, you, those invariables, and then you need a plugin, an executable, that implements the spec, and you simply pass them in. So you exec the CNI binary. You pass in JSON via standard in, and you will get your results via standard out. Any errors will come on standard error. Real, real simple. It's, 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 very, it's meant to be simple and lightweight. And essentially, this is an example of a bash script that I have that sets all this up. Usually, I parameterize it, but I wanted to make sure that you can see a working example. And you literally pass the bridge binary, the config, via standard in, and the results are going to come back as JSON on standard out. The container world seems to love text in JSON. As someone that's been doing embedded networking for my life, you would never use text for any of this stuff. But it does make it scriptable, and that's the, the big win, and that's one of the reasons why people are using it. I'm sure there's a billion others. So now this is an example of the config that was piped in before. You need, again, very verbose, it's JSON. You give it the version, and that will be checked to just for sanity by the plugin. There's a name of this config file, not to be confused with the, the file name. Some, and this is something that can trip you up in the real world. The name that you use would be this name, in example, test BR0. The type is important, that's bridge is literally the name of the plugin you are going to run. Bridge, Mac VLAN, IP VLAN, et cetera. 
And then this, this bridge here, because it's a self-tied bridge, the parameters are dependent on what the plugin is. And in this example, the bridge is a Linux bridge, and the name is testbr0, and that will ex be the exact name of the device on the host. So if you do an IP, uh, IP address show, you'll see testbr0. And if things Mac VLAN, there's similar parameters. I'm not going to bore you with all of them. They're, up, they're on the, uh, the GitHub repo. But it's, uh, is Gateway is telling this config is going to go off and say, okay, everyone that you create, every container is going to use this guy as the gateway. And IP mask will be true so that it's also going to go off and start letting you NAT into it. I'm sorry, it'll let you NAT out. So if you want to get to the internet, I need coffee. Uh, and then a few other things. Here's the IPAM. In this case, it's host local. And it'd typically be a different config, parameterized usually. Something like Ansible can roll these out. And every node would get its own sitter so that as you have more and more, contain more nodes running these containers, you won't get address collisions. And if you have more than one node and they want to talk to each other, that's outside of CNI. You have to make sure these two bridges can talk to each other. Way, you know, usually via top of rack switch, or if it's running on one of the cloud providers, that'll all be provided for you. They'll make sure that all your nodes can talk to each other over VPC or some equivalent. And other thing, route. There's the default route. All these containers using this config will get a default route to go through this guy, through this host, and DNS server can be supplied or not. It's up to you. That's just a bit very basic, and this should this is very similar, if not identical, to what's in the GitHub repo for the bridge plugin. But wanted to just tie some stuff together. Nice so hand. So now, this is a more advanced config. What I've done with the previous example is just using Bash and you know, piping things in and out. And you can do a lot with CNI, for especially debugging and getting your things configured properly. But now when you start going to some of the advanced configurations, and again, this is very simple. CNI is not complicated, but it's advanced for CNI. And that's, you can start what they call chaining plugins. And that's where there's an implicit chain between the bridge plugin and IPAM because you usually have to have an address in the container. But now you can start doing things like, OK, I want to start port mapping. So there's a plugin for that that simply says, yes, I want to enable port mapping. And then the meta plugins, and these you can have many of these. You don't have to just have these three. You can have a tuning plugin that starts playing with the syscontrol values that live in the container itself. And if you wanted different containers to have different values, it's up to your orchestration tool or your own tooling that will start making these values different per node. Or per invocation, you could change the config on the fly if you needed to. So that makes sense? Because some of the power of the CNI is in letting you have your own plugins to do just what you need to do. Whereas you don't want to write your own bridge plugin. You can just use it. But you might want to start doing some stuff like I was playing with a plugin that would actually have the address that was finally given, talk to, I can't say Quagum anymore, free range routing, and have it advertise the route so into the network so that people can start getting to this. We were, we were running ECMP into the node or all nodes in the cluster. And instead of load balancing with something at layer 7 or natting every damn packet, we just started advertising this container's any cast address as it came. And when the container goes away, it'll, go, it'll get withdrawn from the network, all because we didn't care if it was Mac VLAN, Bridge, et cetera. We just did the one little part that we cared about that was unique to that cluster. Everything else, using standard off-the-shelf tools that come with CNI or the orchestration software. Make sense? Clever as mud? OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the runtimes. And one comes with CNI called CNI tool. And the reason I bring it up now is when you start using some of these advanced configurations, you can't just pipe standard the config into standard in and get the results back. Because the way the plugins work is the results of the first plugin, like the bridge, 
will return to the next plugin, like tuning or port mapping. And so you need to be able to start taking the results of the first, the, the, the results, what's returned from the first plugin gets sent into the next plugin. And things all have to line up or there'll be an error. So doing that with the initial example I used won't work anymore. So something called CNI tool was used to do all of this for you. And it will take the results of the first chain plugin and feed them to the second, et cetera, et cetera, until it was done. And then it will eventually return the results to standard output. Any errors make it the standard error. And there's just an example of using it. And that was the, this port map MCC. That was the config I showed you previously. Just to tie it together in case you want to look at this back home. OK, so the next runtime, this is kind of, pardon me, and Red Hat's pushing it. It's compatible with Docker. It's essentially I symlink, symlink Docker to Podman, and I don't know the difference. The difference that's, that's helpful for me and one of the reasons I use it is it knows about CNI and it has the ability to fully utilize all of what, everything that CNI brings to the table. And here's just a, an example. If you were to swap Podman with Docker, that command will look the same. Up to a, and with Docker networking, you might have different parameters and stuff. But one of the things that Podman does that makes it more useful than CNI tool is you're actually starting to deal with real containers, not just playing around and debugging. And it'll go off, and you can start listing all the networks you want. Each one of those would be the name of the network in the, con of, you can have CNI config directory, can have many networks defined, and this is how you can start using them all. So this will go off and start a Apache daemon site, force a habit, Apache container, PID will be one in its own network namespace. It'll be its own C group, typical container, in its own um, bind mount so that each one of those containers will be on these networks. They won't, be able, they won't know about each other, but they can't talk to each other via the network. How they talk to them is up to how you make the, the, the bridge of Mac VLAN or whatever you want. You have to wire them up, of course. OK. So and this is just an example. You specify multiple networks, so it's instead of using the Multus plugin, the Multus CNI. Correct. You, and one of those could have been Multus, but you don't. You don't want to get any. You own, you, know, you don't need Multus when you're using something like this, for example. I'm going to talk about Multus eventually. And one of the reasons we need it. So here's an example of running the command, and this is essentially I went in and well, there's the command again, and then you look at. With bash, you go into the container with bash, and you can see that multiple networks are created, and each one has its own sitter. And so you've got Apache on what would have been a dual home host. So, so the dash p is the port mapping? Yes. Uh, I use this, this command as some, something that you would have seen in Docker if you g Google. Okay. You right, so if we, if we would have provided this container, in, not in uh, a soft running like VS or something, but uh, a hardware function, virtual function, whatever, mm -hmm. would we still want port mapping to be? So how is this port mapping implemented in the kernel? It's IP tables? Yes. So if we would have provided them a, a hardware function, we would still want this? No, typically what command you use is up to you. No, if no, I I, uh, no I'm, from your experience, people would still want this container to use port mapping, sure, right? Even if yes, because a yeah, a lot of people. So, so now, so now we have to offload this port mapping to the hardware, right? Yeah, I wouldn't do it if I could. A little so, so we have to integrate. So for instance, today uh, we have a today we have a TC workshop and we have some control plane in Linux based on TC Flower to upload mm -hmm. sort of uh, classifier action stuff to the to hardware. Mm -hmm. And but this doesn't exist for IP tables. So I, I wonder how this use case would have worked. Well, on, uh, this is just a very simple example of how to use. Yeah, I'm just trying to think it out loud now, how this okay, would work but on offloaded be hardware functions. Because your question, one of the things I did and how I got exposed to all this CNI in the first place was I wrote custom plugins for my site that would use hardware offload 
of various types that I'm not allowed to talk about. But it, the, the beauty, like unlike Docker, where Docker you have to fit into the ecosystem, I, I can't do it justice. I'll let the Docker guys speak for themselves. But one of the, we initially started with Docker because most of the runtimes used it. But when I wanted to go into the container and do extra stuff, I couldn't, and that's how I eventually found out about CNI, and these chain plugins let me go into the container as all the stuff's being plumbed together and then do whatever I wanted to do. And one of the things I could have done is eat tool to on, with Mac VLAN on the right NIC from the right vendor, and it would offload a whole bunch of stuff into hardware. That was just one example. And then The Mac example, example that's very good because it's broken by that from vSwitching, but I'm not going to go into that. But we were, this back is an old, uh, <laughs> we were using Mac VLAN. Are you with me? Yeah. We're open environment. So again, this is just an example of how you can get C CNI to be used and plumb multiple networks. You can just keep adding those. So here's a case where Apache's running on two different NICs. And you know, if Apache is supposed to be only tied to those NICs, then it's up to you to make sure it binds to just those and not wildcard, for example. Again, that's up to your container. I just want to explain the networking. So you can see the two NICs. Let's see. OK, so now Kubernetes. Kubernetes will use CNI, thankfully. And in fact, Kubernetes will, with Docker will use CNI, whereas Docker itself doesn't. So Kubernetes will go off and uh, creates the, net, the container with net equals none. And before it lets the container do anything else, it goes into the namespace because it has everything it needs to, and it will start invoking the CNI plugins that I've already bored you with earlier. And that's how it's able to get CNI, use CNI with Docker containers. Similar, you know, and the Podman that I showed you a minute ago does the exact same thing. At the end of the day, you're running an executable, you're piping in JSON config on standard in, and you're going to get your results on standard out. Anything that does that is a quote unquote container runtime from the CNI point of view. Okay, so, but Kubernetes does just enough to get one NIC in a pod. Everyone know what a pod is? Uh, let's see, so what happens is Kubernetes tends to only have one NIC, one con CNI config defined, simply because it's only going to ever give you one NIC. You don't have the flexibility of specifying a bunch of networks. And if, if you have more than one in NetC, CNI, NetD, or wherever you specify the config files to be, it will just find the first one alphabetically. And that will be what you get for your eat zero inside your pod. That's it. Okay? And so, I, again, CNI will do the add as the way I've already mentioned. There's nothing special about it. So, and this brings us to Maltus. This is verbatim from the Maltus website. And one of the things it exists for is, in part, when I showed you the pod main example where you can specify multiple networks, CNI won't let you do that. It wants eat zero, and that's all it knows about. But a more advanced applications want, for whatever reason that unique to that application, it wants more than one NIC, say, streaming or just Multi -ten whatever they happen to, whatever their business need is, th they want the ability to have eat zero, eat one, etc. And Maltus allow that. And this is just an illustration of what the problem is. Kubernetes will simply the parts created. You get eat zero, and that is it. The eat zero might be on flannel. It could be anything else to talk to other pods in the cluster, but it doesn't know about anything else except how to get to those pods over eat zero. So Maltus comes around, and you can use party annotation to start it. To, you're going to always get eat zero from the classic Kubernetes way. And if you wanted another net device, you'd get net zero. You can have more than one of these if you want. And what Maltus does is Maltus will look to Kubernetes as the CNI plugin, and then Maltus goes in and acts like the example I used before, Podman, or, and it'll call CNI multiple times 
to give you net one, net zero, net one, whatever you happen to define to Maltus. Make sense? So to Kubernetes, it looks like the one CNI plugin, and to CNI, it'll call the plugins multiple times. And the plugin config is going to look at a lot like what I already described earlier. You can have chain plugins. You can have, um, I believe you still can. You, you can have more than one interface. You can do IP tables. At least you, I know with, with Podman and, and uh, CNI tool, you can. Multis might need, to, I'm sorry, Kubernetes may need annotations to support some of what's already in CNI. Okay, makes sense? And this is just illustrating what I mentioned before. So where before you would just get eat zero, and flannel will be the example of the CNI main plugin. You now have Mac VLAN in this example would create the net zero interface inside the same pod. The IPAM for Mac VLAN is completely different from the one for flannel. And those two networks know nothing about each other unless somebody you know, creates a routing loop or something like that inside the topology. Go. Uh, regarding Multus, so, but if I remember correctly, only the first interface is the one that Kubernetes actually... Yes. But he, Kubernetes won't, doesn't, it's a power-sucking alien. It, there's nothing else, the, Kubernetes knows nothing else, and it, it does cause some problems, or at least has the potential to. Like, like somebody trunks those, if there were two different bridges, and someone trunked them, they're going to start seeing each other's traffic. But that's not unique to containers. It's just a classic problem. No, no, I'm talking about the services. So if you enable services, it's done, I think, only, only on the on, first yes. uh, network. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, what's... No, I'm not a big fan of what they... We wouldn't need Maltus if Kubernetes supported all of CNI. And, yeah. and we wouldn't need NAT and port forwarding if everyone would just use the, you know, one container per network, one IP per network. So, so the solution, as you mentioned, will be to use the pod, some, I forgot the name. Portman? Yep. Well, that's not a solution. It's, it's A, it's not V. It, de yeah. it depends on what you're doing. And there's no, no, no saying that Kubernetes can't use Portman. They use the same cryos the runtime they use, and it does the exact same thing. But Kubernetes will never, until they get around to calling CNI more than once, one per network or however they want to configure it, you're only going to get each zero. In, in, a, in a given pod. Mm -hmm. so, so other things have to come up to let you do, and that's why you need services, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that Kubernetes keeps adding in, and they've got their ways to get not sell traffic in, whereas when I've used other runtimes that supported CNI, I just simply had one network for not sell traffic and another one for east-west, done. And if I wanted a DMZ, there was another one, and it was, I already, my networking staff knew how to deal with all that. There was no magic. That nothing was hidden from them. And we could take full advantage of everything Linux has to offer as opposed to waiting for the runtime to catch up and give us some of the stuff that we're, we know we needed because we already were running things before containers. Okay, so let's just get through the, um, some, some more Kubernetes in respect to CNI and then networking. So I kind of alluded to this already. A pod's going to have eat zero. It's going to be able to talk to another pod, typical Kubernetes networking. That pod, however, has its own sidecar containers that will implement net one, zero, net one, et cetera. And how you make use of this, if you even need to, is up to your application. I've seen streaming. I've seen some people want security. That those could be IPsec. Well, However, you, whatever you need to do that drives you to have more than one network in a pod. My classic example, being a networking guy, I want not sell traffic coming in natively. I don't need any extra applications that I have to define and don't have full control over because I've got external dependencies to get traffic in. Now, if you're on a cloud, a lot of those are given to you. If you're on bare metal, you've got to solve a lot of problems that the cloud would give you. And that's where having multiple interfaces with CNI can simplify your life. And you can standardize on your existing security practices that you would have normally done for VMs or whatever else. Whereas you have to shoehorn them in on the side. 
this way. Okay, and this is just some of the way, the, describing some of what you can do in the pod annotation to actually get multis instantiated. The app talks to Kubernetes API. There's a resource definition to, for the pod, and it's going to go off and say, I want network yellow, red, green, and you're going to end up getting them. And this is what some of the JSON looks like, the YAML, sorry. So you tell Kubernetes, I want control, data, and the arguments, each zero, mode bridge, et cetera. So this is, describes the metadata involved to actually use the, this Mac VLAN interface. And you, you're going to start noticing that this looks a lot like what you've already seen from the prior, prior bridge config that for just CNI, because that's all it is, CNI. It's going to be packed in JSON inside the network attack attachment definition. This is just tying together what Kubernetes does with what I was just mentioning. Okay. And again, you start, there's the first, the annotation says I want a network, it's Mac VLAN conf, and Kubernetes will go off and make this stuff happen. Syntax is pretty straightforward. And as expected, a container is a container, and you're going to be able to get your interface configured, the first one's what you would have got with Kubernetes without anything special, and then they multis uses net x, net zero, net one, et cetera, for the interfaces it configures. You don't seem to get a way of specifying your own. So I want to finish up with some of the problems we've seen with CNI. This is regardless of what's using it. Kubernetes, Multis, I'm sorry, Kubernetes, uh, Podman, Mesos, any of the other runtimes. And one of the problems we hit with coming from the network infrastructure towards the server was the networking guys knew networking. And one of the first things that we found was the network namespaces in Linux, not libvirt, but namespaces, they, the Linux bridge has a way for all the containers to connect to the bridge, VE, except the host does not use this. It just sits on top of like CBR0 or BR0, whatever you want, Docker 0. And so it was, people were looking, would come debugging. They were trying to find out, well, where's the port? If you look at LibVirt in the VM world, they actually have a VE pair that will go from the host into the bridge. Where it wasn't done this way for whatever reason predates me. And it, stuff like this, though, does cause problems. For example, the MAC address of the host would end up being the lowest MAC address of all the containers in the bridge. Remember before how I mentioned containers can come and go? What happens? The MAC address of the host starts changing. That's always fun on a Friday afternoon. And what happens, you start, anything that connects to the host, which can be things like storage or any of the existing applications that haven't moved over to microservices, all of a sudden TCB timeouts would, would occur because you can't reach it anymore. The MAC address changed because one container started, not even went away, just started and then it with a lower MAC address. So the, when you start doing a lot of this, it ties back to some of the differences between VMs and containers. You have to understand what's going on with microservices to make sure that you're addressing everything, especially when it comes to debugging. And let's see. NAT, of course, is a problem. I think Orr touched on it earlier. You don't, if you can help it, don't use NAT. You don't have a choice with certain runtimes. Most people want to, or they don't know that they don't need NAT. Double negative. In the, in the early days, ha you'd go to a cloud provider with containers, and you'd run everything on localhost, and you'd port map. Port, you know, 8080 would go to port 80 on one container, 8081 goes to another. And that was the only way to do it, and you get your LAMP stack up pretty quickly. You would have them all contain, all the different aspects of that LAMP stack would be containerized. And it was great. And your application so successful, you needed another VM or a bare metal node. You did the same thing again, but they don't talk to each other. So then over the container world starts figuring out how to make these things talk to each other with something like Flannel or VXLAN, and 
no one ever went back and changed the application to not use port forwarding. When you could simply have every container talk to each other via the interface. And a lot of these tools today still do not support IPv6 at all or well. And the problem with that is, well, if you continue, if, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Will the V6 implementation of, say, Kubernetes, will they continue to net every packet for, to support services? Don't know, but if people in this room don't start helping out and driving the networking for what's going on with containers, we may have it given to us, for example. Uh, let's see. Uh, regarding NAT, you mentioned here NAT as a NAT inside the container? From the host From to the get in the container. No, but this is kind of a sec for for example, you, you using NAT also to do the services. For if you want to do the load balancing, for example, between the pods, right? S are yes. you talking about this NAT or you're talking about a NAT that is specifically for this uh, container? It for both. It depends. Like if you go to um if you want to get into your container from another container, one of the ways to do it would be when you, you run the response to HA proxy, and it's listening to all these ports on your local host. And it will net into, port forward into, the actual container that's running. Whereas that container already has an IP address, you could have used it. But a lot of times, it's not being done because NAT was there first. OK, so you, you're talking about the NAT that is done as part of the services between, like, for example, that's you have two pods on different, ter that's one to talk in from a different service, mm -hmm. right? Yep, okay. so all of it. Yeah, so it's not something that is run inside the container. It's Correct. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you could if you wanted to. I, I, I don't suggest it. You could run, once you have your own namespace, you can do whatever you want. You can still run IP tables there. You can run all the usual, I don't, I've never seen it, but it's, you can do a lot of things that you might probably don't want to or shouldn't. But this is all on the host to get into the container. Right. Anyone else? I don't want to keep everyone from lunch. Uh, OK, so the, one of the things that the, con the containers in this networking do besides that is you have debugging this is starting to be, there's no tools. It's still early in a, lo in a lot of ways. And you know people know how to debug VMs, bare metal, but with containers, there's a lot of, the debugging is not as advanced. Make sense? There's, uh, there's some stuff that's also lacking. We, the runtimes have to do things, so what might work one runtime won't work with another. A lot of them aren't really doing, as far as I can tell, standard error tends to get lost when there are problems. And there's no way to, for CNI anyway, with our plugins, to be able to go off and start turning on debug levels just so that you can go from info, debug, whatever, to, to help debug errors, or at least know that things are going wrong. And with that, it's lunchtime. Any questions? Mike? And I'm around all pretty much through the weekend, so. You mentioned problems with IPv6. What about non-IP-based interfaces? Is that handled by Maltas at all, or does that I, require specific CNI plugins? You can create a CNI plugin that will not do anything. There's none that I know, but it'll give you a NetDev device. You don't have an IPAM, so you will not get an address. And now you've got a Layer 2 device that you can run anything you want on. So does the no, I'm thinking about like, for example, if you have like an 802.15.4 device or something like that on the you host could that you want to make available to one container. Yep, yeah, you can any device. Well, one of the plugins you have is you can stick a real device. Mm -hmm. You can take one of the main plugins is you can take a real device. You buy a NIC, any type of device. If it shows up in NetDev, you can move it right into the container. So it doesn't have to be Ethernet. It could be IoT related mm -hmm. or whatever you want. So is that handled by uh, by Maltos today, or does that require Maltus, writing a specific plugin today? You need a plugin for your device, okay. but uh, let's see if it's a, if it's already seen by NetDev, you might be able to use the host device plugin. Okay. I'd have to try it. Maltus is orthogonal because if it's in NetDev, 
Maltus knows how to call CNI, you just configure Maltus to use that CNI plugin. Part of the goal of these plugins, and especially the chain plugins, the meta ones, you don't want to reinvent something that's already there. When I was first working with this, chain plugins didn't exist yet, and I wanted to start doing some things with BGP, DNS. I had to cut and paste the bridge plugin or the Mac VLAN plugin, and then just add things to it. Whereas now with CNI version 3 plus, they support chaining, and you just add the one little piece that you want. So you'll get invoked after everything's already set up properly. Instead of returning back to the caller, they'll call you, and it gives you a chance to do something, whatever that happens to be, and then you're done. So you can write a real small amount of code to do whatever you need for your business, for your application, and just return to CNI, and it's all plugged for you. Because it will call you inside the network namespace and let you do any tuning, anything else you want, might want to do that isn't available with the existing plugins. And are you aware of any specific requirements that we need to fulfill on the kernel side for new subsystems to make that work? N not that I know of. I mean, you need, if, you, if you would run outside of containers, if it already works, it should be in. You should just, you should just be able to call it, invoke it. Okay, well, thanks. Enjoy. <laughs>